song. Would you take God's word this morning and open to the Gospel of Mark? And I want you to come to chapter 15. And we're going to read a few verses here. We're going to read verse 21 on down through a few verses. Would you stand for the reading of God's word today? Mark chapter 15. And we'll start at verse 21. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place of Golgotha, which is, being interpreted, the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, whatever every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Thank you. You may be seated. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we uh, come to this portion of Scripture feeling as if, Lord, we're standing upon holy ground as we look today at this narrative that tells us of the crucifixion. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us understanding that you will bless us as we study this today, that you'll speak to hearts of those that are here. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mark tells us here in in chapter 15, verse 22, they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. Now, there's disagreement today among scholars as to the precise location of where this actually took place. There's actually two different uh, sites there in Israel that are debated. The the traditional site for the place of the crucifixion of Christ is at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The church was built, of course, later over the site that they believe was a place where Christ was crucified. If you ever go visit Israel, the Holy Land, you'll notice that in many of those holy sites, uh, the Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church or some other church seems to always want to, uh, want to build a building over those sites. And if you ask me, kind of ruin uh, the value of that site by putting a church there. That's one site. There's another site that is located just outside the Damascus Gate of the old city of Jerusalem. And if you've ever been there, I've been there, and you can look at the hill, and indeed it does, the rock formation does resemble a skull. That ugly guy in the picture there is me, kind of blocking your view, but you see right over my shoulder there, you can see the rock formation and how many believe that to be the location. In fact, the late, the late Major General Charles Gordon who visited Jerusalem in 1883, and he passionately proposed arguments that this was the real site of the death of Christ. This was the place called Calvary. So there's a debate today. Protestants believe this to be the hill of Calvary. Catholics believe it to be the church of the Holy Sepulchre. And there, frankly, are good arguments on both sides of this issue. If you do look at that rock formation, again, it does indeed look like a skull. But let us remember that regardless of where the specific location was, what's more important is what took place, that Jesus paid our sin debt. Visiting there, I've often wondered what it would have been like to be there at the foot of the cross uh, when Christ was dying for our sins. You ever try to imagine that, being there at Calvary? Now, this seems to be the focus of Mark. What he does in his gospel is he draws attention to the various people in the crowd at, at, at Calvary there, at Golgotha, as he calls it. And Mark is more restrained in his description of the physical torment that Christ endured there. After all, Mark is writing to Romans, you remember, in this particular gospel. He's writing it to Gentiles. He's writing it to Romans. Romans knew crucifixion. That was their form of capital punishment. So there was no need for Mark to get into the detailed descriptions of the horrors that a person went through when they were crucified. Anyone in that day who ever saw a person being crucified never forgot what they saw. Suffice to say that the suffering that Jesus endured there at the cross defies description. And in May of, uh, or excuse me, March 21st, 18, or excuse me, 1986, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, it it carried a 
a study that was done over the crucifixion of Christ. This was the most complete medical review ever published in any medical journal over the crucifixion. And the authors, they detailed all of what Christ would have to endure, and it's really astounding. They concluded it by saying this, quote, death by crucifixion was in every sense of the word excruciating, literally out of the cross. That's where we get the word excruciating from. It literally means out of the cross. And it's a word that was used to describe the pain of crucifixion. The Roman writer Cicero described it as the cruelest, most hideous punishment possible. And so if you read through the Gospels, what you'll find is that none of the Gospel writers really focus on the details of the pain that Jesus suffered at the crucifixion. It's as if the Gospel writers kind of draw a curtain over that scene. In fact, God the Father may have done the same thing. Look in chapter 15, look down at verse 33, and notice what it says. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, the sixth hour, by Jewish reckoning, was 9 a.m., excuse me, the third hour was 9 a.m. in the morning. The sixth hour then would be 12 o'clock noon when the sun was at its zenith. And the Bible tells us that right at 12 o'clock noon that there was darkness over the whole land. That is an epic miracle. That is incredible. That right at noon it would become dark as midnight. And this was God the Father throwing a blanket over his son during that time of the crucifixion. I see in this the loving act of God the Father towards the Son. Also, it was a sign to all those that were there that what was taking place was supernatural. But what Mark does in his gospel is he focuses on the people that were at the cross. You'll notice that there are various groups of people that Mark and, frankly, other gospel writers mention. Some were there at the cross out of compassion, Others were there out of a morbid curiosity. There's something in human nature that are very, very curious about things like this. One of my favorite preachers, Dr. Jerry Vines, commented, he said, in the early part of this century, the 20th century, public hangings were common. He said, I remember hearing my grandfather talk about these. He said, they would hang men in the center of the town, criminals, they would hang in the center of the town, and the whole town would come and witness it. That's kind of what's happening here at the cross. People are coming all over to witness this and see the crucifixion of Christ. I heard about a great preacher who was preparing a sermon on the meaning of the cross, and when he went to bed that night, he dreamed about the cross. He saw the nails driven into the hands of Jesus. He saw the crown of thorns as it punctured his brow. He saw the sword as it was thrust into his side. All these things was more than he could bear. And so in his dream, he ran up to one of the soldiers, grabbed him and turned him around. And when he did, he saw his own face in the soldier. And in his dream, he was experiencing really the truth that all of us are represented there at the cross in one way or another in the crowd that was there. So I want us to kind of look at it from that vantage point. I want you to see the different groups of people that were at the cross and how they represent us. And maybe, just maybe, you might see yourself at the cross in this passage. First of all, notice the soldiers. Look, Go, go back to verse 16. It says, And the soldiers led him away into the, into the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. This would be Pilate's judgment hall. And you might remember that Pilate, even though he knew Jesus was innocent, allowed him to be crucified. And you know why? Because he was a corrupt governor. And he would rather allow an innocent man to be crucified than to suffer uh, the consequences. So through political expediency, he uh, allows Jesus to be put to death. And they're there in that judgment hall. The whole band is what it says, which is the word cohort. This would be 600 soldiers and they're leading Jesus away, and they're beginning to mock the Savior. Verse 17, and they clothed him with, a purple and, with purple and platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Here they're mocking the fact that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. They twist together a crown, and they thrust it on his head, lacerating his brow. 
where blood would pour down into his face. And they gave him a purple robe. They, they gave him a reed. And uh, in other pl- uh, places it says they used that reed to begin to beat him on the head. It was kind of a mock scepter that they were doing there. And look in verse number uh, 19. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him and bowing their knees worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to be crucified. Later on in verse 26, it says they placed a sign over the cross which cynically read the king of the Jews. What they were doing here is they were playing a game with Jesus called the game of kings. There are historical records of this. There are etchings on the floor of uh, buildings in Jerusalem that, that show this, that depict this, a man who is sentenced to die, how the soldiers will cruelly mock this person and play games with them. And they would hit him and say, hey, prophesy unto us. You're a prophet. Tell us who hit you. And they would have a big circle and they would push him from one to another and one would grab his beard and pull the hair out, and another would hit him with his fist, and another would spit on his face. And this is the treatment that Jesus was getting there, the scorn of all of those soldiers, and they really beat him unrecognizable. Unknown to the soldiers, they were actually fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah 52, 14 says, And as many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Now, these soldiers represent people today that still hate Christ. You realize that this world hates Christ. If you don't believe me, go out in a public square somewhere, in a public place, and bring up the name of Jesus. You can talk about a whole lot of other things. You can talk about politics and sports and all these other things. And, but when you bring up the name of Jesus, you're going to get a lot of scorn over that. Reflected in this quote from a man who said this, Christ was not God, not the Savior of the world, but a mere man, a sinful man, an abominable idol. All who worship him are abominable idolaters. And Christ did not rise again from the dead, nor did he ascend to heaven, end quote. That's the typical response of people today. The scorn, the mockery, the cynicism. But what these people don't realize is that one day they're going to stand before him. Because one day the Bible says God the Father is going to commit all judgment into the hands of the Son. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You will not escape judgment, sir. You will not escape judgment. Paul Harvey used to tell the story about a man named Gary Tyndall who was charged with robbery. While standing in the California courtroom before the judge, Tyndall asked permission to go to the bathroom. They let him go. He went into a a private restroom with the guard waiting outside. He crawled up into the ceiling tiles thinking he was going to escape. And in that little confined space, he began to crawl south, but suddenly the ceiling tiles gave way. He fell down on the floor in the courtroom right before the judge. You're not going to escape judgment. You will appear before the judge. And those who mock Christ today will not escape his judgment. But then there's number two. There's another person, Simon the Cyrenian. Look at verse 21. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. It's interesting to me that Mark knows the, 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 the two children of this man, and he calls them out by name. Now, remember, Mark is writing to the Romans. He's writing to the church at Rome. And why does he draw attention to the names of this man's children? Well, because these two became prominent Christians in the church at Rome, which leads us to believe that Simon became a believer. In fact, Paul will mention uh, the name of Rufus and his mother in Romans 16, 13, where it says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. This would be Simon's wife. So what happened that day, you can kind of put it all together, can't you? Here's Simon the Cyrenian. He's a man from North Africa. In all probability, he was a black man. He was coming there for the Passover to worship at the Passover. He just happened to be there along the Via Della Rosa while they were leading Jesus away to to go to the cross. 
And when Jesus was too weak to bear the cross because of all the loss of blood from the beatings and the scourgings, Jesus was too weak to bear his own cross. That was part of the, of the, uh, of the execution that the criminal, in this case, of course, Jesus was innocent. But the victim had to bear their own cross. And Jesus couldn't because of weakness. So here was this man, Simon, who just happened to be there. And the Bible says he was compelled to carry the cross. The word compel is a word to press into service. This was a word that was used whenever a Roman soldier would draft a civilian to do something for him. This happened all the time. When a Roman soldier was carrying a heavy backpack and he didn't want to carry it, he would call out to a civilian, hey, you, carry this. And it was according to the law. You had to carry it at least to the, to the next milestone, one mile. Remember what Jesus later said? Whoever will compel thee to go one mile, go with them twain. Give them an extra mile. But every, every once in a while, a Roman soldier would draft a civilian to do something like this. And here is Simon just minding his own business, and a Roman soldier grabs him and says, Here, you, you carry this cross. And suddenly this man is bearing the cross of the Lord Jesus. What a privilege. What a privilege that was. Now, he wasn't doing it because he volunteered. He was compelled to do it. Simon, and by the way, it changed his life. Obviously, later he began to see Jesus as the Savior, got saved, and became a prominent Christian. But Simon reminds us of people who are compelled or forced in some way into knowing Christ. Some of you are here this morning because you were compelled to come here. Your wife made you come. She said, if you don't come, I'm not fixing you dinner. Or maybe some of you teenagers are here today because your parents are making you come. You would rather be home watching TV or surfing the net. You're you're here just to get your parents off your back. And if that's the case, you should be grateful that someone cared enough for you to make you come. It's like one, one person said, my problem growing up was drugs. I was drugged to church every week. But you know what? God uses that. Here was Simon minding his own business. He was suddenly compelled, forced to do something he perhaps didn't want to do. And yet God used that, and it transformed his life. You know, I'm here today preaching because my father compelled me to come to church when he got saved. I'm I'm grateful that my father didn't say, well, I'm going to leave it up to you, because I would never have chosen to come to church on my own. I was rather go somewhere else, anywhere as a teenager. The last thing on earth I wanted to do was come to church. But I was compelled to come. You say, what compelled you? My father's belt compelled me. I know for some of you more liberal folks who don't believe in spankings, that's probably offensive. But I'm very happy that I grew up in a home where I was compelled many times to do many things. But I want to tell you, God uses things like that. And now I am a Christian and bearing my own cross, as it were, like Simon. Simon represents those who are compelled by the cross. But then there's a third group, the thieves. Notice what happens as Jesus is walking to Via Della Rosa. Look at verse 22. And they bring him under the place, Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull, They gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And and with him, they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, And he was numbered with the transgressors. They continued to march Jesus down the way of sorrows, the Via Della Rosa, on his way to the place of crucifixion. And and Luke's gospel gives us a little more detail. Luke tells us in Luke 23, verse 27, there followed a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented. But Jesus turned unto them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves, And for your children, for behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren. Verse 30, 
Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall they be done in the dry? So get the picture. Jesus is still moving along the Via Della Rosa. There's a multitude following. There's a group of women. These are not disciples. These are devout women of Jerusalem who would come at these executions and they would wail over the people and lament over the people. And they would also offer opiates and drugs and give, give them things to drink that would, that would uh, ease the pain. And this is what they were doing with Jesus when they offered him this, but he refused it. And then at one point, this is Jesus' last words before he's actually crucified, he turns to them and says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves, weep for your children. And then he gives a little proverb, dry wood burns easier than green wood. What was Jesus saying? In other words, if they do, if the Roman government will do this to someone who's innocent, what's he going to do to those that are guilty? The green wood represented Jesus, the dry wood represented the nation of Israel. And what he was saying is, if, they, if the Romans will do this to me, what's going to happen to you? And, of course, Jesus there was predicting what would happen in 70 A.D. when the Romans would come in and, and, and destroy literally the temple and over a million Jews would be slaughtered because of, really, this is the judgment of God. And what happens? And the Bible also says that they were fulfilling Scripture and that, that they were casting lots for his garments there at the foot of the cross, and this fulfilled the word of God as well. But here's what I want to draw your attention to, verse 27, where it says that he was crucified with two thieves. And again, Mark points out how that this fulfilled the Scripture where he was numbered with the transgressors. Here's Jesus, and he is being crucified between two thieves. And again, Luke gives a fuller account of this. We know that both of these men, and by the way, they were kind of probably angled to where if they had a conversation, they had to look and see Jesus. And Mark's very clear that these men kind of railed on Jesus at one point. Look at verse 32. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. So that it, during this whole thing, when Jesus was the subject of scorn, the two thieves were also joining in. But at one point, one of these thieves changes. The Bible tells us in Luke that at one point he rebukes his partner in crime and says to him, don't you fear God? All of a sudden, one thief develops in his heart a fear of the Lord. That's evidence of the work of God. I don't know what it was. Maybe he looked at Jesus and he saw something different about that man. Maybe he heard Jesus say the words, Father, forgive them. There was a love about him. There was a peace about him. There was a serenity about him. There was an authority about this man called Jesus. And then suddenly he realizes that he deserves what he's getting, but Jesus does not deserve it. He says to his partner in Luke 23, 41, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. We deserve what we're getting. We're sinners. But then he went on to say, this man has done nothing amiss. Suddenly he sees himself as being a sinner, and he sees Jesus as being sinless. And he knows now Jesus is Lord because he said to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You may have heard me talk about this before, but I think this is the most incredible prayer in the whole New Testament. It is very succinct, and yet it has every element in there for a sinner to come to Christ and be saved. He calls Jesus Lord, and if you're Lord, that, if you call someone your Lord, that makes you what? His servant. So now he's submitting to the lordship of Christ. He knows Jesus is a king because he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. If you have a kingdom, that makes you what? It makes you a king. Suddenly he knows Jesus is a king, and he knows that Jesus is going to resurrect from the dead. You say, why do you say that? Well, because Jesus couldn't help this man if he stayed dead, if death had power over him. Suddenly, this man realizes that Jesus has the authority over death and that he has the authority to determine where this man is going to spend his eternal destiny. He believes Jesus is God. Why you say that? Well, because he said, Lord, remember me. What was he saying? Lord, forgive me. 
for my sins. Who has the power to forgive sin? Only God has that power. And he has faith. Because he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Not if, but when. He's fully persuaded that Jesus the King, who is God, has the power to forgive sin, who has authority, who can determine his eternal destiny, will come into his kingdom. That's real faith. Faith doesn't say if, it says when. He'd say, Lord, if you happen to get out of this, and if you happen to come into your kingdom, remember me. He said, no, when. Here is a a repentant, humble, submissive man who acknowledges Jesus as Lord. And here is a man who is absolutely converted right there at the cross, right there when he's dying. Sometimes people ask me, do you believe in deathbed conversions? Well, we have an illustration of one right here, right at the very end of his life. And you know what Jesus said? Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. No sinner had better assurance than this man when Jesus said, you're going to be with me in paradise. And you know what this tells me? Salvation is all of grace. Sometimes I hear people say, well, you have to do this to get saved, and you have to do that, and you have to be baptized, and you have to... Look, this man didn't have time to do any of that stuff. There's nothing he could do except simply repent and put his faith in Christ. And that's what salvation is. It's all of grace putting your faith in Christ. This man represents those who see Christ and are converted by what they see at the cross. They see Jesus dying for them. They see themselves as sinners. They see Jesus as the Lord, the King, who has power over death and who can determine their eternal destiny. Let me give you the fourth group here. And this is the scoffers. These are the ones that care less. Look in verse 26 again. They write over the cross the king of the Jews. Now, again, the place of Golgotha was located near a well-traveled highway, and so people going to and fro in Jerusalem would see this, and they would see this sign. It was the custom to take a board and write the, the crime of the person being crucified, write it on the board and place it above the cross, and that's what they did here. What was Jesus' only crime? That he was king of the Jews. That was not a crime. That was true. And according to John 19.20, it was written in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek so that everyone who passed by could read it and know. And people that passed by, they would scoff at this. Look at verse number 30, or verse 29, rather. And they passed by, railed on him. They that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. Come down from the cross. And likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Even this religious crowd joined in, mocking Jesus. You would think that there would be some sense of dignity for a man who was dying, but not this crowd, even these religious leaders. And they mocked him, come down, save yourself. Listen, the whole purpose of him dying there was to save you, not himself. He could have come down if he wanted. They were scoffing as if to say he was not the Son of God, but their very scoffing proved that he was the Son of God. You say, why? Because if you go to Psalm 22, which is one of the most incredible messianic psalms in the Old Testament, some scholars call Psalm 22 an Old Testament Calvary because... If you read the words of that psalm, it's as if you're standing at the foot of the cross and you're watching everything happening and you're hearing the Lord. And listen to what verse 6 through 8 says in Psalm 22. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. Does that sound familiar? It's calling attention to the scorn that Jesus would bear there on the cross. And even there in that psalm, it says, he says, I'm a worm and no man. He calls himself a worm. Why? Because he submitted to all the taunts. He submitted to all the reproaches. He submitted to all the suffering. He offered no defense. And he took upon him the sins of the world. There, on the cross, 
Recently, I was listening to a hymn and wondering why people tamper with the words of our hymns. It really bothers me. This is a favorite hymn that I grew up singing. Listen, you know the words. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? That's the way it used to read. You know what it, how it reads now? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? We've changed it. We've gone modern. We've watered it down. Evidently, there were some people that were offended at the idea of being called a worm. Well, let me just tell you, from one worm to a bunch of other worms here, if you understand how sinful you really are in the sight of a holy God, you'll have no problem calling yourself a worm. And by the way, according to Psalm 22, Jesus on the cross called himself a worm. He said, I'm a worm and no man. And why did he do that? Well, because he was bearing your sins. He was bearing my sins. And he would not come down from the cross because he wanted to save you. He did not save himself in order that he could be my Savior and your Savior. And many people, they don't understand that today, and they scoff at the cross. But let me give you the final one here, the final person. That's the centurion. Look down in verse number 33. And when the six hours come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him the drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. So we see the darkness from 12 noon to 3. Then we hear the utter, the cry of dereliction from Jesus. And the people there began to mock, oh, he's calling for Elijah. Again, they're still taunting him, even at this point. John 19.30 tells us what he cried. You know what he said? It is finished. It is finished. That's why I tell you, put your faith in the finished work of Christ. Because your sins were paid for with the death of Christ. The work of redemption was complete when he said it is finished. There was nothing else Jesus had to do. Every once in a while I hear someone say, well, Jesus had to go down and descend into hell and suffer the torment of hell. No, he suffered the torment of hell on the cross already. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant it. Nothing else needed to be done. And the testimony to that fact is, the, is that the veil in the temple, the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies that had been hanging there for thousands of years, rent, the Bible says, from top to bottom, signifying this was an act of God and that now there was a way that you could approach into God's holy presence because of the blood of Christ, because sin had been paid for by Jesus on the cross. And when the Roman centurion, who was a witness to all these things, saw it, and he was probably there from the beginning. He was probably there from the time Jesus was charged during the whole trial, during the beating, he may have been one of the guys in the circle that was taunting Jesus, jeering Jesus. When he heard the words that Jesus spoke from the cross, Father, forgive them, and all the other things that Jesus said, and he saw the miracle of the darkness and perhaps heard of the veil being rent, all these things, when he put it all together, he came to his own conclusion when he said in verse 39, truly this man was the Son of God. And you know what? He's exactly right. And this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that we hear this confession from the lips of a human being. First time in the Gospel of Mark, right at the very end. We hear this confession from the Father at, the, at the Jesus' baptism and at the transfiguration. Demons acknowledge this, but Mark does not record the confession 
that Jesus is the Son of God from the lips of a human being until this Roman soldier at the foot of the cross makes this confession. You know why? Because remember who is Mark writing to? He's writing to a Roman audience. And he is focusing on the salvation of Gentiles. And here he is showing the audience that a hardened Roman centurion, when he sees all these things and puts all the evidence together, comes to this conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God. Here we have the conversion of a hardened Roman centurion. This goes to show that the cross can save even the most hardened sinner. The most hardened person can be changed or convinced by the cross. So which group do you identify with? Where do you see yourself? Are you like Simon who was compelled to to, to consider Jesus? Are you like the scoffers, cynical about who Christ was? Are you like the thief that you've been convicted and you repent and turn to him? Are you like the Roman soldier who is putting together all the evidence of Christ and you come to the conclusion that he's everything he claimed to be? the Savior, and I submit to him today. The great Dutch artist Rembrandt has a famous painting of the crucifixion, and when you look at it, you're drawn to the cross and the dying Savior, but then you also notice the crowd that is gathered around. He does a beautiful job painting the different people in the crowd, and you can see their attitudes on their face. But finally, you'll notice at the edge of the picture, alone figure, almost hidden in the shadows. And you know who that is? That's Rembrandt himself. He paints himself into the picture there at the crucifixion. And so should we. We should paint ourselves into that picture. And we should ask ourselves, where am I in all of this? Do I really understand and grasp the meaning of the cross? And has the cross of Christ changed me? Let's bow for prayer together today. Father, I thank you again for this beautiful narrative and how it draws us in again to the foot of the cross where we see again our Savior, our precious Lord, bearing our sin. We see him hanging there on the cross in agony and in shame for us. And he did not come down because he was dying for us. We see, again, the indescribable price that was paid for our sins. And I pray, Lord, that every person here under the sound of my voice will will be like that Roman soldier who said, truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, he's the Savior. They'll be like that thief on the cross and say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, Lord. You are the Lord. You are the King. You are the one who has all authority. You're the one who is the judge that will determine our eternal destiny. So forgive me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. If you're here today and that's your prayer, would you just take a moment and just just tell it to the Lord? You don't need me to pray for you. You can do it right there by yourself. Tell Jesus, Lord, I know you are the Savior. You are the Son of God. And I repent today and I turn to you and I ask you, save me, Lord Jesus. The Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. Pray that, friend, and he'll save you. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.